Our scripture lesson today, as Beth told the children, is from the Acts of the Apostles, a book in our New Testament portion of the Holy Scriptures that talks about the early church. And we hear now some of the struggles that were going on for those early followers of Christ. In the fifth chapter, we read, One council member, a Pharisee and teacher of the law named Gamaliel, a well-respected by all the people, stood up and ordered that the men be taken outside for a few moments. He said, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you intend to do to these people. Some time ago, Thaddeus appeared, claiming to be somebody, and some 400 men joined him. After he was killed, all of his followers scattered, and nothing came of that. Afterward, at the time of the census, Judas, the Galilean, appeared and got some people to follow him in a revolt. He was killed too, and all of his followers scattered far and wide. Here's my recommendation in this case. Distance yourself from these men. Let them go. If their plan or activity is of human origin, it will end in ruin if it originates with God, you won't be able to stop them. Instead, you would actually find yourselves fighting God. The council was convinced by his reasoning. And after calling the apostles back, they had them beaten, and then they ordered them not to speak the name of Jesus. And then they let them go. The apostles left the council rejoicing because they had been regarded as worthy to suffer disgrace for the sake of the name. And every day they continued to teach and proclaim the good news that Jesus is the Christ, both in the temple and in the houses. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. How many of y'all remember the saying, talk to the hand? Some of you do. Some of you do. It was the ultimate blow-off. When someone said something that you didn't want to hear, they said something that was disagreeable to you, you would put up your hand, you turn your face the other way, as if to say, I'm not listening to you. What you have to say is not worthy of my time to hear. If you just want to hear your voice drone on and on, go ahead. Talk to the hand. <laughs> it's the ultimate in disrespect for what other people have to say, disregarding their opinions not being willing to be open enough to try to understand where they are coming from and why they look at things differently than you do. Discounting other people and making them feel less than yourself. In his book, American Gospel, John Meacham says, if totalitarianism was the great problem of the 20th century, then the greatest problem of the 21st century is extremism. How true is that? We seem to be pushing further and further towards the extremes on both sides of the spectrum. And how are we to be the church that the world needs in a culture like this? As I wrestled with that question and was working on this sermon series, I was reminded of the story of Gamaliel, the character that we just read about in that portion of the Acts of the Apostles. Gamaliel shows up several times in the scriptures, a wise and respected Jewish teacher, a Pharisee, who actually taught Paul when he himself was a Pharisee before his conversion, a respected teacher of the law. 
Gamaliel was a member of the Sanhedrin, which is the ruling Jewish council of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, located in Jerusalem around 35 AD. And he, in this passage that we read about, it takes place sometime after the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit has descended upon the disciples and they are going out and boldly preaching about Jesus, about the one that they are following, the one who suffered and died and rose again, the one who promised them life and life eternal that spirit that empowered the disciples to go about teaching and preaching. And somehow their preaching and their teaching really infuriated the religious leaders of the Sanhedrin. And so they call a special meeting, and at this gathering they take a hard look at the disciples, and they make a decision that they want to not just keep them in jail, but to kill them. They need to put a stop to the boldness of these people who are going around preaching about Jesus. Now I want to stop there for just a minute. Why do you think they were so infuriated that the disciples were preaching and teaching about Jesus? What was so threatening to them about disciples telling other people about Jesus? Certainly, people were believing the disciples and following the disciples. But the disciples were not hurting the Pharisees or the Sadducees in any way. They weren't being violent. They were simply telling their truth to all who would listen and hear it. I think at the bottom line... These Sadducees and Pharisees were afraid. They were afraid of people believing something different from what they believed. They were afraid that people hearing what the disciples had to say, that the disciples would start believing something very different from what they thought was the only truth that everyone should believe. They were espousing an understanding of the ways that the world works that were different from the ways that they had always believed and that they were teaching their own worldview. Now, if I'm honest about it, it bothers me when people have such a rigid stance in life. And yet... I have to admit, I can have that rigid stance in life too. I mean, y'all know my little Joey, bless his heart, when he gets old enough to know that I talk about him all the time, he may be embarrassed. <laughs> but he will be two years old next Sunday. And I think about his little life a lot. And I think, you know, what if he ends up being connected to a group of people who teach him that prejudice is right? What if he ends up being connected to a group of people who don't represent my values? What if he ends up being connected to a group of people who teach him that it's okay to be a racist? I would be afraid to have him be connected to any group like that. I would fear that they would somehow brainwash him. And I would want to keep him away from any group that was trying to teach him that it's okay to hate other people. There are things for us to be afraid of and to keep our children away from. But to be honest with you, I wouldn't go to the extreme that these Sanhedrin wanted to go to. I wouldn't want to wipe the other people off of the face of the earth. I would want to pray for them. 
I would want to reach out to them in some way if I could. Fear can cause us to act in ways that can undermine the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, some of you probably know the story of Karl Marx. I was reminded of that as I thought through all of this. Karl Marx, the father of communism, was not fond of religion, as you know. He called it the opiate of the people. But why did he have such a dislike for religious faith, I wonder? Historians say that it goes all the way back to his childhood, and there have been a couple of stories told about this, a couple of theories. Maybe you've heard both of them or at least one of them. One of those stories goes like this. It says that Marx came from a devoutly Jewish family, and they lived in a predominantly Christian village in Germany. His father was a businessman, and his father discovered that if he became a Christian, he would be more popular with the people in the village, and then they would purchase things from him. He'd be more profitable in his business. And so he converted to Christianity just as a sham in order to get more business. Karl Marx saw through the fakeness of religion. And that turned him against it. But here's another historical perspective. It says that the villagers, the Christians in that little German village, despised the Jews. They blamed the Jews for Jesus' crucifixion. And so they boycotted Marx's father's business because he was a Jew. They tried to run him out of town, and for the sake of being able to provide for his family, his father relented and became a Christian, simply so he could survive and provide for his family. Now, which of those stories do you think really would have the power to turn someone against the Christian faith? I've thought about that a lot because it tells me that the way we react to people who look differently, think differently, and have a different worldview from us can undermine our efforts. Maybe the Sanhedrin were afraid like that, and they just, out of gut reaction, wanted nothing to do with these disciples of Jesus Christ. But here's another thing. Another reason that the Sanhedrin might have been so against these disciples is that they could have genuinely believed that they were right. And they didn't want anyone else to ever think anything differently. My friends, I, th I think that a lot of people in our world today are just like that. They are so convinced that they are right. They want everyone else to see it their way. But I remember a very painful time in one congregation that I was a part of. I wasn't a pastor at the time, but I remember being a layperson and sitting in a church council meeting when people in that church council were arguing over some stance that they wanted their church to take. And they were literally yelling at each other in that church council meeting. We need to vote for it. No, we don't. Yes, we do. No, we don't. And they kept giving their reasons. And they talked over each other, interrupting one another, not really listening to the other. And at one point in that council member meeting, I remember standing up, with tears in my eyes, and I said, people, people, people. And they all looked at me, and I said, you know, I understand that all of you over here really, really, really believe that this is what God wants us to do. And you people over here, you really, really, really believe that this is what God wants us to do. But you know, Jesus said they will know we are Christians by the way we love one another. 
there's no love in this conversation. They all looked at me for a moment and they went right back to arguing. <laughs> How sad is that? Sometimes we hold on so much to the ideal of being right when that is our only aim that we end up letting go of the deepest values in our faith. You see, to say I believe is different from saying I am right. And it's a powerful thing to hold on to what we believe without making someone else wrong. Too often today, people are unwilling to understand other people's opinions and to be humble enough to ask themselves, could I be wrong? Maybe there's another way to look at this. And when we hold on so tightly to our own beliefs, my friends, we don't leave room for the Holy Spirit to work in our lives or in the other person's life. Because if we stop and listen to the other person's side, we can model for them to stop and listen to our side and to pray for the truth that may be somewhere in between the two. Gamaliel reminds us in this story that we need to listen, for that is exactly what he does at first. He listens to the rest of the Sanhedrin. He listens to what they have to say, and as they start to turn their opinion into a crusade against these disciples of Jesus Christ, he speaks up. And in doing so, he shows us the first step in civility and respect, a willingness to not let go of our own beliefs, but to speak the truth in love, letting our voice be heard, just as Beth told the children, being bold enough to hold on to our own beliefs instead of keeping silent and leaving it up to someone else and allowing the train to go away from the station. If we're bothered enough about a matter, maybe the Holy Spirit nudging us to say, interject something here. Practice civility as you do it in respect for the other person. So how did he persuade them? He says to them, I want to remind you of history. I want to remind you that we are not the first people to deal with a controversy like this. So remember how things happened in the past. He wasn't saying that directly to them. He wasn't saying, you stupid people, look at what's gone on in the past. He just wanted to bring up to them, let us think about this a little bit. These things have happened in the past. And I know that you want to honor God. But if these people are following after God and you fight against them, you're fighting against God. Now, my friends, that's a key moment there because he was appealing to their deep faith. He was saying as I tried to say to the people in that church council meeting, I know you are a people of faith. I know you love God. I know you want to do the right thing. And if these people are wanting to do the right thing, and if they are of God, God will take care of that. God will take care of that. You speak God's truth, and let them speak what they believe is God's truth. And pray for discernment in the process. Don't treat them as the enemy. In sharing those words, Gamaliel was reminding them that the Old Testament writer of Ecclesiastes has said, God has put eternity in everyone's heart. Tap in to the Holy Spirit's presence 
in the midst. Learn the art of disagreement without being disagreeable. Learn the art of being respectful in your disagreement. Unfortunately, too many people in our world today have forgotten that. We draw lines and separate and forget to look for the spiritual in our neighbor. In our culture, we're losing that art. In many ways, we've already lost the art of respectful disagreement. But I want to remind you of something that happened a few years ago that modeled for the world what the church, I believe, is called to model for the world. Some of y'all may remember a few years ago, Jerry Jones, the owner of the Dallas Cowboys, invited several guests to watch the Cowboys play the Packers at the Cowboys Stadium. And two of the people that he happened to invite were George W. Bush and Ellen DeGeneres. Some of you, even if you don't remember that incident, you can already tell these are two people who are very different from one another. And as luck would have it, during that football game, Ellen and George sat right next to one another in the Joneses' box. The cameraman knew that the Jones family often invited celebrity guests to these football games. And so during certain portions of the football game, the cameraman would pan over to that section in order to show the viewing audience pictures of these celebrities. And so they did that during this game, and there they saw George and Ellen sitting beside one another, and one of the commentators said, look at this, we have George W. Bush and Ellen DeGeneres sitting right next to each other. Let's see what kind of fireworks are going to go off between the two of them, because they're so different. And so as the game went on, this is what happened. George W. Bush and Ellen DeGeneres both watched the game and they had a delightful time. The cameramen showed them talking to one another, laughing together, smiling, enjoying the game together. They got along. They were talking and laughing as different as they are they were kind to one another. And as America was watching this, some people became offended. And they thought, how on earth can Ellen DeGeneres sit there beside that man? Doesn't she know what he believes and what he thinks? Doesn't she know how different he is from her? Doesn't she know what kind of opinions he has a people like her and they handled it in a very mature way they went straight to social media and they stamped out phrases like this why is Ellen being so kind to that man doesn't she know who she's sitting next to doesn't she know what he believes well, Ellen got word about all of this firestorm that was going up of people being mad at her for being kind to someone who saw things differently from her. And this was back when she had her television show, so she had her platform. And in her opening monologue, she said to everyone, she said that she understood that they were criticizing her and so this is her quote. Why is a gay Hollywood liberal sitting next to a conservative Republican president? Well, when I end my show every day with the phrase, be kind to one another, I mean it. I'm not just saying it to get better ratings on my show. 
I'm not just saying it because it makes me look good. I actually believe it. We are to be kind to everyone. And she went on in her monologue to talk about the fact that she has a lot of friends who think differently than her, and she doesn't expect everyone to think the same way that she does. But she said that doesn't mean that we need to treat them disrespectfully. Jesus said the same thing over 2,000 years ago in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, if you love those who love you, what reward will you get? For not even tax collectors are doing that. And if you greet only your own people, you're not doing more than others. Do not even pagans do that? Jesus is saying, if you're just kind to the people who are like you and who act the way you do, who have the same interest you do, don't expect to impress anybody or help them to see things differently. The bushes heard what Ellen said and they heard about that firestorm on social media. And so they issued their own public statement. It said, President and Mrs. George Bush really enjoyed being with Ellen and Portia. They appreciated Ellen's comments about respecting one another, and they respect her. Think about it, my friends. How insane is it that Ellen DeGeneres and the Bushes had to make a public statement to defend being kind? Our world is hungry for this kind of kindness. Our world needs a church that will model respect and kindness for everyone without giving up what we believe, without being wishy-washy about our own beliefs, but being open enough and caring enough to hear what others have to say. In our text today, Gamaliel did not control the outcome of the council. He simply appealed to the spiritual heart of these men. And he let God do the rest. May we have the courage and the faith to so live. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.